Hey there and welcome back to another Miraculous Ladybug Season 5 review and today we're going to be talking about the plastic recycling special episode called Action. And yeah, of all the episodes of this show that's been released, this is certainly one of them. I wouldn't say it was bad or anything like that, but I wouldn't go out of my way to ever watch this again. And on top of that, I do think it's been hampered by the fact that it was released after the events of Season 5 had concluded, so... We've seen the ending of the Agress Dark, we've seen that Gabe dies, and that Paris rapidly develops into some new modern day utopia, all because of Miss Bustier. After all, she was elected mayor, somehow, but let's not dive too deeply into that. The point is that we've had the ending, and whilst that doesn't mean that this episode lacks any value, I think if you're going to have an episode like this, that turns back the clock so to speak, it really needs to deliver to be really good and add something you hadn't seen. Something that in turn enhances the storyline. But, you know, this doesn't. It's not bad, it's just average. If it came out before the ending, that'd be one thing. But here, it's just really hard to care, and there's nothing that breaks through to make you care. But that being said, it's not like it was terrible or anything like that. It's just one of those episodes that you know for a fact is going to be forgotten. It's not their best work. But regardless, we're going to be going through the episode right now, so strap yourselves in, eh? Okay, so we start off the episode watching Marinette and Adrian make their way down to the houseboat with... Adrian adopting a pretty interesting pose on the back of that there scooter, just arms down, unmoving, not really holding on or anything. Looks like he wasn't properly animated if you ask me, just weird, a really weird looking pose. But anyway, they arrive at the boat and talk to Nino, who's looking stressed and needs their help. He then explains what's been going on, that they've been using the houseboat as a makeshift plastic collection and recycling centre, which, I don't know, I don't think this sounds very legal. And I do think this is a bit of a hazard and would surely just need permits and whatnot, wouldn't it? And almost certainly, You'd not be able to do it on a houseboat. A houseboat moored in a residential sector. Surely, right? What if something goes wrong here? Is this not a massive safety risk? A public safety risk? <sighs> anyway, the whole class seem to have gotten involved in a very anti-plastic today, which is a good thing. But how did they all manage to coordinate this so quickly whilst Adrian and Marinette were just none the wiser? How did they set it up? And also, how did they convert this boat so quickly and easily? Like, this is a very complex operation. They're sucking up the water through the bottom of the boat into the machines while siphoning the water back into the river. And on top of that, it's not like this is just a random boat that they've commandeered. This is their friend's house. Why would Anaka even agree to this to begin with? Like, what is she thinking? And at the same time, they give us this massive group speech about how plastic's bad. You know, the kind of speech you'd expect to see on Sesame Street. But I get it, they're trying to bring awareness to an environmental issue. So it does make sense to dumb it down, so to speak. But my goodness... It's a bit much. Anyway, quite predictably, the massive machine is going to need a bit more infrastructure than a houseboat can provide, and so it melts down and it explodes. But luckily, they all get off the boat just fine. But it does explode, and they're back to square one. And they should be footing a pretty hefty fine at the minimum. Apparently, the cause of all this pollution, which overloaded the machine, is an influx of fans that are being sold by aggressed vending machines and are approved by City Hall. And I guess people are buying them and then just instantly tossing them out. Doesn't make much sense to me, but sure, why not? Also, a fan's not usually made of, like, paper or something? Or a lighter material than just plastic? Why are we blaming the plastic guy? And so, yeah, apparently, according to the episode, the fans are disposable, and you get a new one each day from the vending machine. Are people actually that stupid? And also, how long have they been out? Surely not long enough to have the whole river filled with just them. After all, if they're so common, how have Marinette and Adrian not even heard of them before? Also, when the machine was starting to struggle with all the plastic and was about to explode, why didn't they just turn it off? Why? Why would you let it get to the point where a catastrophic explosion is imminent? Such a moment of pure negligence just makes everything worse. After the explosion, they seem to face no consequences at all and instead create a plan to meet with the CEO of a plastic company, I guess. Guess this guy just makes all the plastic, all of it. Really specific job. And it's a really weird thing to be a famous person for. Like, can you name an actual real plastic mogul in real life? Like, I can't. Seriously, I know like a couple CEOs, but none of them for a plastic company. But apparently he's very famous. And so yeah, they go to Marinette's parents' bakery to get her dad's order from the company, which would give them an excuse to go to the company warehouse. And also maybe things are different in France, but most bakeries I've ever been to use paper bags and cardboard. Almost no plastic to be found outside of very, very specific instances. But Okay, sure. Also, surely the company would simply make deliveries to the bakery, and Tom would never actually have to go to the warehouse. So how are the kids suddenly able to go there? Feels very inefficient for Tom to have to always go and pick it up. Also, Marinette fumbles her way through a sentence with her own dad. With her own 
dad. And so how is it that this group is always letting her do the talking to anybody? Like talking to the dude, talking to the CEO, talking on the broadcast. How are you going to trust Marinette to do this? Maybe use the journalist or the model slash actor. Just feels way more risk free. But what do I know, right? They then pick up the order and the warehouse guy brings out a final box of their order, which he claims contains 10,000 plastic bags. Press X to doubt. And look, I know plastic bags can be compressed pretty easily, but 10,000 is a lot. Surely there is not that many in that box. And if there was, surely he couldn't lift it so easily. And honestly, there just isn't enough boxes in general for an order the size that Tom gave them. Which in turn makes me ask, did he really think the kids were going to be able to deliver this back to the bakery for him? To even pick it up? Are they just going to carry it there? Oh, oh well. Let their business fail. See if I care. They then ask to speak to the CEO, which is like asking your server at KFC if you can speak to Colonel Sanders. Like, yeah, sure, I have his phone number right here. But obviously this actually does happen to this specific man quite a lot, as they've installed a plastic animatronic that points up at the skyscraper where the office is, which, come on. How many people are trying to get in to see the CEO of a plastics company? And if they do want to see him, surely they would simply understand that they Google where the office is located and maybe call up to make an appointment, instead of turning up at this random warehouse. These stupid kids. And then they manage to fail upwards and actually get into the office. And as it turns out, the security for the office are actually big fans of Adrian and simply want him to sign their fans. And thus, they do believe that he has a meeting with the CEO because it's believable, even though he has no manager with him, no parent, no guardian, no nothing, just a bunch of teens in costume. Also, I just love Nino quietly having a panic attack in the background of the scene. Classic. We then meet the CEO, and I gotta say, this is pure slander on my boy, Colonel Sanders. That old boy did not craft a business empire designed to fatten us up, only to be spoofed as an evil plastic tycoon out to make a quick buck at the expense of the world and the environment. For shame, Asterisk. For shame, Zag. Like, how are they gonna do this to my boy? Pretty sure KFC uses mostly cardboard as well, so the slander's even worse. Never forget. And then the kids give their pretty terrible presentation, literally just telling this guy, Plastic's bad, you should use biodegradable materials. Come on now, you think this guy doesn't know this? You think he doesn't already understand? And then he speaks, and oh my goodness. Southern American accent. That's what he has in the English dub. This slander on Miss Sanders. Oh, all he ever did was make fried chicken. How you doing this to him? Anyway, he tells him tough shit and that the whole constant cycle of chucking out old plastic and selling new items is what makes him rich. So it's not changing. Yeah, it feels like anyone could have told them this. Also, apparently the Alliance rings are made of plastic. I figured they were metal or something. <laughs> Bit of a surprise. What, are they just plastic like a ring pop? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> Makes them seem cheap and tacky. Why would you want to wear that? But yes, he blows them off and they leave in disgrace. And they need to think of a new way to stop plastic pollution. So somehow they get an instant meeting with the mayor who also blows them off instantly. And how'd they even get a meeting to begin with? Come on, what's the mayor doing? You got a job, mate, do it. Next up, Adrian tries to speak to Gabe who shoes him away and tells him the fans are a fad and that fad is making him a lot of money. So hit the bricks, kid. And then they go to the TV station to try and convince Nadia to give them a chance and to give them some airtime. But of course they fail as she rightfully tells them that she'd simply get fired as the Plastic King is their number one sponsor. And so Markov and Max break a lot of laws to hack into the news broadcast and hijack it with their own messaging with the help of their superhero friends from across the world. Okay, so Max is surely getting arrested for this, right? And Markov is surely going to get confiscated. Imagine terrorists getting access to this sort of tech. And right now, I mean, looks like these kids are on the early path to eco-terrorism. They're confronting CEOs and politicians, they're hijacking broadcasts, and accidentally or not, they did technically blow up a boat and a house in one fell swoop. And also, the cut makes it look like Marinette is in the dressing room when the broadcast about the fans begins, but then is also somehow instantly back on the boat moments later. So did the report simply last a long time and yet still just talk about those disposable fans the entire time? Or did they wait another day? What's the chronology here? But yeah, highly illegal shit going on right now. If nothing else, Max has put his ass on an international watch list for life. And then they do the little speech calling out plastic pollution. And of course, they give a major speaking part to Marinette, who famously gets easily flustered, loses her train of thought, mumbles, stutters, and mixes up words. Excellent choice of spokesperson, if you ask me. What could possibly go wrong? But hey, 
At least they did get some of the others to chip in as well. And then we time jump to the next day in what is actually a pretty slick transition. I liked that, not gonna lie, real cool. Anyway, we see the mayor doing some damage control, taking away the vending machines and having a Justin Trudeau moment when he says that Paris is at the forefront of the fight for pollution, when he actually meant the opposite. Canada is a major oil and gas producing company, uh, country. Did find that funny. God, slimy Andre was the best Andre. And now this has reminded me that they tried to pull a half ass redemption out of his ass. And I'm sad. Same with Gabe, really. I really do love that they all just instantly manipulate the press into hating on the Plastic King and his company. <laughs> Bad luck, mate. Get served. And then Gabe taunts him over FaceTime. Oh, you love to see it. So pink Colonel Sanders finds himself pretty darn tootin' steamin' mad. And then he gets akumatized into the King of Plastic by Gabe. Seriously, this one's just an absolute win by Gabe. He dodges the bad PR. He makes heaps of money from the fans before they go out of fashion and they got the bad PR. And then he manipulates events to avoid any punishment and also have a shot of getting miraculouses by ruining this dude's life. Big time W for Gabe. I love that they had to pad out some time though. So they actually bothered to show the full Gabe to Monarch transformation. Really stretching it out to hit that runtime. Anyway, it turns him into Plastic King or whatever, who turns people into solid plastic with his weapon, but also has the useless Venom power which freezes people. So makes one of those powers redundant. Because I would assume that being turned to plastic is going to freeze you anyway, so I don't think you really need both. Not sure about Gabe's logic here, really. King of Plastic then takes out those who have wronged him. He starts with the mayor, whom he confronts in his office, and chases right to the front of City Hall before finishing him off. And I gotta say, the mayor did deserve this, especially since he instantly tries to backtrack and bring back the vending machines and the fans to save himself. But nah, he gets got, goodbye. As do all the cops outside. And I gotta wonder, how did the police assemble so quickly? Kinda crazy. Do they just all wander out the front of City Hall? Plastic King wants to go after Gabe next, but of course, Gabe can't come to the phone right now. Before we cut over to Adrian and Marinette, where white, blonde-haired Adrian gives Mandarin lessons to a mixed-race Marinette whose mother actually immigrated to France from China. That, that does feel a little weird to me. They split up and they power up. And once again, we pad time by showing the entirety of both of their transformations. <laughs> Jesus. And then off we go. They catch up with Plastic King outside the aggressed mansion, where he's just turned Gorilla into plastic. Oh, poor Gorilla. But very brave trying to fight this guy, even knowing he has superpowers and a massive stick. And I like that they showed Adrian getting angry and starting the battle in an aggressive manner. After all, Gorilla is the best boy. And he looks out for Adrian any chance he gets. The king then beats the shit out of them though, and tosses them both onto the hood of the car, which surprisingly, sustains little to no damage at all. Now that's some quality craftsmanship. And then he turns Cat Noir's staff to plastic. And I gotta wonder, why didn't it also turn Cat Noir to plastic? He's still connected to the staff when he's using it, right? Very confusing to me, but okay, we'll roll with it. Our heroes then beat him up a bit and force him to run away. You know, pretty decent fight sequence, I gotta add. He runs away, heads to the houseboat. Yes, the houseboat didn't blow up, really. Bit confusing, especially since later on the guy actually pays to have it repaired. Like, what's going on here? Anyway, he takes out our hippie lovebirds and sets his sight on the rest of the class before the heroes arrive and they beat him using plastic. And they prove that plastic is actually fantastic, which to me sort of defeats the purpose of the episode. Isn't the whole point of the story that plastic is not the solution to your problems? You shouldn't have it be, well, plastic's bad except for this really specific instance where it saves the world. N no. Oh well, so they defeat him and all's right with the world. Colonel Sanders even turns over a new leaf and fixes the houseboat and immediately shifts his business towards biodegradable materials and not disposable plastics and by doing so, tanks it completely. Let's be realistic, the share price is going way down. And apparently this becomes a worldwide movement and it's a happy ending for all. <laughs> I mean, this ending was kind of pretty cringe, not gonna lie. What's up with the drink bottles at the end as well? Did you seriously take this commercial marinette using your own branding? Doesn't feel very humanitarian if you ask me. I mean, this episode in the end just feels like a weird fever dream. It's up there with the time they actually met Santa and proceeded to beat him up. And so yeah, that's the end. Goodbye, Gabe. That's it for you now. No more, Gabe. <sighs> this episode kind of sucked, actually. But I would say it was just enough camp and cheesy to be a little bit enjoyable at times. Although, I'm still very salty about this Colonel Sanders spoof. How are they doing this to my boy? How are they doing this? And so yeah, <laughs> there's not really much else to say. So I'll throw it to you. 
What did you think of this special episode? Did you like it, hate it, somewhere in between? I'm curious for your thoughts, so make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and let me know.